So the theme for today's camp is gratitude, and I'm gonna, we'll talk a little bit more about that as I'm teaching, but I'm going to start with genuine gratitude for all of you showing up here. It's very cool to come every two years, devote a weekend to come work with us. I really appreciate it. I was looking back when the first SBG camp happened, and I believe it was 1996. So, but, okay, 1996, and there was 15 or 16 people there, um, and they were all young males between the ages of 18 and 25. And we started doing the camps because the organization had started to grow, and there was some instructors from Chicago and the South, also the UK and Ireland. And the camps were really a chance for us coaches to get together and train with each other and share information about what we had been learning, not just about the technique, but something I spend probably even more time thinking about than technique, which is how to coach well, how to teach well. And since then, they've grown, obviously, and um, you know, I'm happy with the way it's grown. The last couple of years, where I've really been thinking of what makes the perfect training environment. Because over the 30 years I've been doing jujitsu, I've had students and people who've gone from white belt to black belt with no training to world class competitors, and I've seen people do it quickly and efficiently and really well, and I've seen people who've been blue belts for 25 years. And I've seen both and, and I, one of the questions I think myself as a coach and other coaches ask ourselves all the time is why, what can we do to change that up and to get people good at this art as quickly as possible? And I think I have a formula for that now. I like all my formulas. It's a triangle because I love triangles. And so I call that the performance triangle, right? You can't have a stool with two legs. You need those three legs to have good base. So the triangle means that often as well, but for me I usually find that anything I think is important usually breaks down to three main points. So when we're talking about performance, I'm going to go into this in depth as we go, but the three things are environment, curriculum, and training method. You have to have a great training environment. You need to have the correct curriculum, which as you guys know here is always going to evolve around fundamentals, and then of course the training method is what sets everything else apart. And it's a combination of the three that creates skill, good skill. Training method, envir or environment, the top part here, there's different words for it. So if you talk to any of the gym owners that have big gyms, and there's quite a few in the organization, and you ask them what they think the most important thing is for growing a big gym, <coughs> I can almost guarantee you that every single one of them is going to say something that will translate as culture. And culture is a big word, but... Um, that is the most important thing. That's the environment you're training in. That has to be a healthy environment, right? And there's three main things for having a healthy environment. And we're going to go through them. But the first, always the most important, it has to be safe. Safety, right? If, that's, if you're getting hurt, if you're coming in and people are getting injured, then that's obviously not a healthy environment, not a healthy culture. We want it to be safe. And one of the hardest skills to learn in jiu-jitsu and it's certainly been, I think, the hardest skill for me to learn, is probably one of the most important, if not the most important one, which is learning how to relax and how to roll competitively, but relaxed. And the jiu-jitsu instructors that I admire, the people that I've gotten to train with who are really, really good, and I'm gonna even go so far as to say wrestlers as well, every grappler I've ever worked with who's great is always very relaxed. Wrestling, on the ground, judoka I've worked with who were Olympic champions, they were always very relaxed. It's that combination of being relaxed. And that's super hard for people. It's been very, very hard for me over 30 years to figure it out. And I know it's hard for a lot of us. So how can we have a tool which makes everything safer but also helps you learn to relax? Because when you relax, you're gonna learn a lot more. You're gonna be able to problem solve during the round, which is super important. That's why I like long rounds. Right, all those things, and the only thing that I've come up with that really fixes those things or helps you fix them is your breathing, which is also why I think Hickson always starts his classes with breathing. You can go de in deep with the breathing, but I'm going to give you super simple instructions right now that you'll be able to do immediately. And what I'm going to ask is for my whole section, and I hope, for, hopefully, for the rest of the camp, you put it into practice. 
right? Even if you don't want to do it, trust me and just try it for the next two hours with me in this class and I think you're going to really like it, okay? So we're going to start, just lay on your back. And I'm going to put one hand on my belly and I'm going to put one hand on my chest, okay? I'm going to breathe in through my nose and as I'm breathing in, my stomach is going to rise. And as I breathe out, my stomach's going to go down. And I'm breathing out through my nose as well. So just keep your mouth closed. Breathe in through your nose, stomach goes up. Breathe out through your nose, stomach goes down. You can breathe through your mouth as well. Some of the old school Brazilians who hear us as they're controlling the exhale. But for now, let's just go nose, right? Breathe in, breathe out. Keep doing that. And as you're doing that, keep your, uh, your hand on your chest should move and you're maintaining that kind of relaxed pace. Now when we drill in my class now is going to be a combination of drilling and technique. When you drill, I want you to try and drill using this breathing. <coughs> so keep your mouth closed, breathe through your nose, and try and keep your breathing regulated and relaxed. And the awesome thing about that is, it's going to be almost impossible for you to go too hard if you do that. You're going to find just by doing this that you're going to work into what I think will be the optimum amount of competition and relaxation. You're going to enter into a state where I think you'll learn more. So just to recap, to finish it up, performance triangle, right? You need three things. You need the environment, curriculum, and the training method. You need that community of people to get better at jujitsu. And we're always trying to balance there healthy and challenging. It's got to be healthy so when you come in, you're getting stronger and healthier. You're not getting broken down, but it's still got to be challenging, right? You want to challenge yourself, and you need both. You need to be out there pushing your limits, learning what you can do and what you can't do, and all the great... Uh, lessons we get from those kind of trials while at the same time balancing it with healthy so you're not broken and all beaten up we all want to be on the mat when we're 80 90 right i do i want to be on the mat forever so you got to imagine you got those like the angel and devil voices although they're both really angel voices but you got two right you got that one side telling you you got to get out there and compete and go and push yourself and that's necessary and good you got the other side reminding you, hey, you want to be doing this when you're 80, and if you go like this too hard today, you're not going to be able to train the rest of the month, and that's important too. And so we balance that. With the curriculum for SPG, I can't hammer it at home enough, just fundamentals. You will pick up all the other weird shit off YouTube on your own. <laughs> that's what's going to get you better, faster than anything else. That's, going to, that's what's going to work in a fight. That's what's going to work in a self-defense situation. And if you go to a school that's focused on fundamentals, what will happen is when you meet the black belts, they're all going to be very different. Right? I've used for years, I've used Travis and Rick just because they're a convenient analogy for me. But brothers took mostly the same classes at the same time from the only instructor, which was me. They're both good black belts. But if you've rolled with them, you know that I couldn't, you couldn't possibly pick two styles that were more different from each other. If I tried to design two black belts that were more different from each other, I couldn't really do it between either one of them. And yet they had the exact same structure and took the same classes. And it makes sense when you hang out with them why they roll that way in a social environment. Then you'll get to see it, right? But if Travis tried to roll like Rick or Rick tried to roll like Travis, they wouldn't be as good as they are. And so in that environment, Kane, Diggins, every black belt in my gym, every they're all totally different. And sometimes most of the schools I go to these days are all SBGs because why would I not do that, right? I'm limiting my seminars. I'd rather spend time with you guys. But on the off chance I take a seminar somewhere else, oftentimes what happens is I'll watch the black belts in the room and I'll watch them train and they all, they're all doing the same thing. They do the same pass. They try the same sweep. And usually it's whatever's in fashion in competition right now. And they're all doing, they're basically doing their instructor style. And that's a school that's technique by technique, not fundamentals. So that's what I don't want to do. That's not what it's about. So, and with the fundamentals, again, there's always a balance between objective mechanics, which we're always looking for the most efficient way, and those run deep. And no matter how long you train, you're bound to learn something new about those objective mechanics, right? I'm, 
guarantee you that in the next five years, I'll learn something new about an elbow knee escape that I don't know right now. That's just the way it works. But you gotta blend that with some humility and understanding that all the application of those objective mechanics is gonna be subjective. And you gotta give students space and you gotta look and go, there's always gonna be somebody that's gonna break those rules and make it work and allow the room for that. So we're balancing again their objective and subjective applications. And last but not least, training method, and there we're balancing between what's realistic and what's safe and healthy for you. We've got to have the realistic pressure so that we can actually make sure that what we're doing works, while at the same time adapting it for the level that you're at so it's not counterproductive. The whole time in your mind you understand that failure isn't just okay, it is necessary and a essential part of the training system. That's what it's all about. If you have those three things, which I'm confident that we do in SBG, that good environment, that good tribe, that good curriculum, which is always getting better all the time with the input of all the black belts in the organization, people like Henry that are bringing the material, and the training method, which we've been doing for 30 years, that alive, training method where we break down the material for people. I don't think anybody does that better than our coaches at SPG. And those three things, you're bound to get good. So remember nothing else from my class, remember that. And I appreciate it. Uh, I got a lot of stuff that I want to get out. I wrote it down to try to keep me uh, somewhat centered. But it's we're going to start from the back and we're going to see where it takes us. And I'm hoping to get us in the mount, maybe a little bit of half guard. It's mainly a posture that I'm gonna work on with you guys. And it's a lot just from what, um, kind of what, what Franco was doing at the last camp, we're just tucking the hips in that closed guard position. We're gonna use that for, for back escaping or passing as I like to call it, and uh, butterfly passing as well. Okay. So grab a partner that's somewhat equal in size, obviously, and though it doesn't have to be exact, but grab them and let's warm up. And you guys just get, you know, back to front uh, and escape however you want to escape to warm up nice and light. And remember that, remember how it feels, and then later on when we go back, we'll retest it with the posture and see if you guys do a little bit better. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So the first part of the posture that, that that's important is protecting that inside space. If it goes away, that's fine, we can deal with it, but start until we get maybe later, I really want to just focus on I, I dominated that inside space and my elbows are glued to my body. Does that make sense? Can you guys hear me? My elbows are glued to my body. Okay, because I, I'm gonna make I'm gonna make a frame with them on his thigh. I'm gonna use that to, to just kind of hold him in place, not push, but just hold him in place, just like a frame, and protecting my neck. So it's a good posture to have. Um, and remember, big thing for me is it's a way to do it. It's not the only way. It's just a way, and it's my way of doing it currently, or you know, and particularly from this position, there are multiple ways. Okay. You might hear, see, it doesn't make one better than the other. You try it out, you know, scientifically and figure it out for yourself. So it's just a way to do it. And so a couple things, like if you start getting in the idea of chasing the arms or like, if he like grabs, let's just grab my wrist uh, with this arm. No, walk away, break the wrist, walk away. Yeah, this is kind of stuff. I don't want my elbow getting across my center line. Hold on to that. As he pulls that, if I start to feel that go, I, one, I don't want to pull it across, but I'll support it with this hand. Go ahead and pull, and then I'll lynch that down pretty hard, to, right? And now I can still protect my neck, but I'm using my arm to not allow him to do that. So it's just ways to, to maintain that, right? So the other thing too would be um, him trying to obviously bury and dig that hand underneath. I'm gonna push my elbow into my rib cage and just kind of crunch because it takes that space away, right? And I know that hand's there, so now I'm more worried about this hand getting into the neck. So I know that I can protect this side in here. I don't want to reach because now he's got that. Does that make sense? So just little tricks that you guys can use to, to maintain that spot. Use your own arms to make frames on them so they can't pull them away. I don't want my elbow or my arm to go outside of my silhouette. I'm protecting that. Right? I don't want my arm to go across, my elbow to go across and above. So if we have center line here and center line here, I don't want it to go above this line. I don't care if it goes across, you know, we get into this. I saw people and they were asking me, what are your feelings on putting your elbows inside and doing that? We'll get to this stuff, but it's mainly about protecting that inside space. Super important. Made, made my point off my soapbox? Yeah. Uh, the question, if the backside person needs 
like connection, but you're still in this position. Yeah. Is that still safe, or is that? I, I'm not worried about this. Okay. Really? I'm, I'm, I'll get out. I'm not going to show it because then you'll do that, and then we won't get <laughs> anything else. Guys are always the ones that ask, "Then what?" And I say, "Work on the now what, then we'll get to the then what." Okay. Make sense? <laughs> okay. So. This is that posture, just with the arm. So that's the first thing, and I've made connection to my ribs, and I've made connection to his thigh slightly here, and we're gonna make the connection better. So you're looking at three postures I saw. Actually, there's four, truly. I think this one, except for super genius over here, he, you know, I think it's difficult to get to this position. Is it possible? Can you do these things? You know, you're looking away. If you can get here, great. Um, but if you can't, and you find yourself in the role that you're back to chest and they're reaching, you're going to have to do this posture. And you're going to have three different postures, right? You're going to be flat on your butt fighting this way. They're going to pull you back, right? And you're fighting here or it's going to be at a 45. Would you guys agree to that? Yeah. So what I want to do is I want you to look at it. This is what I talk about, like passing. He's in an upright guard, right? Or he could be flat or on his side. That's the, that's the posture, right? But you know, a lot of times when we're passing, if we can get him right here in between those two postures, it makes it hard. It's your stomach fighting that, especially when there's pressure pushing on it. It makes it hard for him to hold that. He'd rather be here because he's grounded. He's rather here because he's grounded. Make sense? So stay right there. So what I'm doing is the first posture of this, or the, the set the posture up, is I'm gonna get my butt off the ground. I wanna put weight on him. My son's wearing my shirt. If pressure's not the answer, you're asking the wrong, uh, the wrong question. It's always about pressure, okay? So I'm just gonna transfer my weight from the ground. I'm gonna dig my heels in. I don't wanna be too narrow, and I don't wanna be super wide. But I can feel, you feel that tension already, right? So, because of my elbows. If my elbows are here, I don't have that. It's a little bit, right? But once I put my elbows there, you feel that, yes? So now I transfer my weight from the ground to here. So we do it like uh, in reverse order. How many have been to the optometrist? One or two? One or two? And you're like, oh, two. Click, 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 click. One or two, yeah? So that's really it. Close your eyes. One or two, which is worse? Two. Two, okay? You guys just need to feel that. Now, what I don't want to do is just push into him and drive my back so that he pulls me away. I'm just transferring my weight from the mat to him. So I'm just simply lifting my butt up off the mat, okay? So first part of the posture, and all this needs to be one motion. This is the first part. This will be the second in the one motion that we're gonna make it. But I wanna just transfer my weight. Really quickly, let's just put those two together. Yes? Are you pulling your heels, like kind of pulling your heels towards your butt just a little bit? I am, but we're gonna get to that, see? The then what? <laughs> now what? Got it? Okay, so let's work on the then what, and we'll get to that. So just those two right now. No, no, the now what? So right here, this, and the transference of the weight. And we go one and two to make sure that we, they feel it, they can't pull, so we pressure check it, and then we'll add to that. Just a real quick introduction phase, a minute or two, and then we'll bring it back, got it? So uh, the next one, so the next posture, so all I got you guys to do is just shift your weight up. So my butt's on the ground, my butt's not on the ground. Now it's what I'm gonna do with the hips. Now just do what we've always done in guard. I want you to tuck that tailbone. Tuck the tailbone and you'll see. Watch his feet. Right? And now there's tension there. Yep. Right? And, and right here, just because the arms are in here and I'm still protecting and that tension's there, keeping those knees in line, it's pretty simple to just put weight here, kick a leg out, go, if we want. But it just creates that tension. I'm not allowing my hips. Where's Andy at? What's that? Where's Andy at? Right here. What's that thing in the plane, the horizon deal, altimeter or something? Why are you asking? Because <laughs> you fly. You know you do. Past tense. Yes. Artificial, Artificial horizon. horizon. Artificial horizon. So I don't want my hips to deviate from the, the ceiling of the floor. I want my hips to stay flat, especially when he starts to tilt. If I go with him, I give it to him. Now I'm equal to his posture. But if he falls to the 45 and I maintain flat, he actually lets me out. Does that make sense? If I go with him, he's like, great, now we're fighting this off and I'm in a worse spot. I don't, I, now what happens is we get here and now I have to start to turn my hips flat. Isn't that what we do? So why, why waste all that time, right? As he goes, I got this tension as he goes, he created it because I maintain my hips flat. 
to the horizon. Thanks for the help on that one. Does that make sense? Okay. Tell me if I'm wrong. It feels like when I get my feet flat, lift my hips, and then start curling, that there's a little bit of pulling tension with the feet. Yes. You smile over here. I told him to get to it. Oh, okay. But yes. So I. That's the way to make it work. And one drill, if, you, if your students are having a hard time, you get them to the wall and you make them sit down and crunch, not letting their butt touch. And then yes, I'm using that to pull myself. So 100%. If I do this with the heels, it doesn't allow that. You see my feet move. But if I dig them in and then I pull myself down, it creates that tension, 100%. 100%. So that next piece is, if that helps, pull with your feet, like a, like a curl, but you're you're pulling your hips to curl them underneath, just like you do in the guard, right? I'm tucking that tailbone. It's the same thing. Does that make sense? Ready to add that piece now? You're gonna feel the pressure. Maintain one and two, the, the, the shifting of the balance and, and the uh, arms inside, then add this piece. You're gonna, you're gonna feel massive tension on this and they should feel uncomfortable. They shouldn't feel as comfortable as you sitting, okay? All right, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna spend this First hour, we're going to look at the triangle choke. Uh, hopefully, for the kind of like those of you who've been doing this for a long time, it's been teaching you to suck eggs too much. Okay, but uh, for some of you, what I've noticed with uh, when I was looking at doing a session in Ireland, it was just for white belts, and so I tried to think more about uh, how a choke actually works to explain it to them, so we can get a better end result from that. Okay, and uh, what I noticed was when I started to teach it, even to like my blue and purple belts. We didn't actually really know what they were trying to achieve with a choke. It was just, I'm going to get into a position, I'm going to squeeze really hard. And a lot of times, the person taps. Okay, and go from there. Uh, so, we're going to figure out like, how a triangle choke actually works. And what it is, is there's obviously two little squishy parts carrying all the blood up to my head. And back down again at, at here. Okay, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to close those up. Okay, and it seems quite simple that that should be it. But we need to really focus on that if I actually want to efficiently choke someone. Now with a triangle choke, what happens is one of those squishy bits is being done by the leg, okay? And the other one is being done by your own shoulder. So I have to really concentrate on those two things. I need to reduce the space here, and I need to get a good pressure here, okay? Uh, this will seem a bit simple for some of you, but for, especially for white and blue belt, please do this, okay? I want you to take your hand, just like a judo chop, okay? Just put it next to either side of your neck and just put it on there, okay? Just, just find a bit where, where your artery is. Okay, I'm just going to see if anyone passes out over the next two seconds. Okay, and now what I want you to do is I want you to push that in about half an inch. See if you pass out. You're passing out. You shouldn't get this. So what, what that implies to me is that in order to get an efficient choke, it's not enough to touch this. I, I, don't, I can't have my leg touching this area. It has to compress into here. So I need a connection very close, if not almost inside the line of the silhouette of my neck here, and it needs to go beyond that. So before I start to squeeze, I need to have that part already tightened up, okay? So we're gonna look at from both sides, we're gonna look at how to do that with this one, and then importantly how to do it with this one, okay? So each part has its its own job to do. So can I see you please, Gus? So, I've done a fairly good job saying I've, I've knocked Gus over somehow here. What we're gonna do is, I'm gonna, first of all, just gonna put my foot, on his hip, on the direction that I've swept him. Okay. Then what I'm going to do is I want to try and get this leg into the right position to be able to choke him. So commonly what I see is, and I saw this with a few uh, people here, was this one in a rush to try and get the triangle position or something that looks like a triangle shape. People just slam this around and go here. But actually I can fit an entire hand through here and say hello to you. Okay. But the, the space is still way too much there. So what's gonna happen is, I need to get my hamstring in connection with Gus's neck here. So where I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna change my angle. So this foot is gonna change my angle, but very importantly, this hamstring is gonna push through his neck. So if this one doesn't, this knee doesn't do anything, what should happen is this should almost push him down to the floor. Okay, and that will give me a very good connection with his neck. Now, I don't wanna choke him here because he'll fly through that gap. So I'm gonna counter that with a push with this knee as well. So it's almost like a scissor in effect here, but this should now feel very connected to his neck, okay? Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kick my heel down and pull him back towards me. 
and I should feel like this triangle is much, much easier to close up here. Okay, so before, I'm not squeezing at all yet, but before I squeeze, it should feel much tighter. Yep, there we go. Okay, so he's in his off balance position. My foot goes on the hip. I'm going to rotate myself and I want to push this one towards his head. This one kicks through and my hamstring wants to kick through towards that knee. That should be pushed this way. This curls down and I bring him back to me and now this should effortlessly go here. Okay? I'm going to have a little go at this but the one common mistake that happens here is if you just start in Jiu Jitsu is instead of my head going this way is to do this. Okay, so we're going to try and stay flat on the floor while I kick this through. Okay, and count this. What I should look at now is down his ear. I can see he's directly down his ear. I should have a good connection just next to that. That makes sense for everyone? So, I've done a few things there. Okay, just a quick recap. Oh, we're back choking this. <laughs> so, so here you go. Uh, if I'm anywhere in here, okay, this foot has a lot of jobs to do. Okay, my hips here have a lot of jobs to do. Very, very importantly, remember, I need to get this shoulder into his neck at some point. I don't want to let it escape, so it's going to keep some pressure there. A few people ask, can I use the floor? Absolutely, you can use this if you need to. Okay, sometimes I prefer to use them, it doesn't have to be their hip. Okay, I like use the other person as my floor, but here's okay. But I want to make sure that this counts for pressure from this leg. I want to keep this as snug as possible. I don't really like the word tight, it kind of makes people squeeze too much, but I, want to, I don't want to give space. Okay, I just want to take that space away. So as we go here, this, no matter where I put it, hopefully on the hip, hopefully on his back, but even if you need to go here, this is fine. But what I want to do is I want to make my angle and I want to be constantly balancing the pressure from that claw. Okay? Notice that that knee, if you were to put a line on his head, that knee's above there. Okay? Then, where I should end up to get a perfect triangle choke when I, before I start squeezing, is I should really be down his ear. So if you need to adjust again, just make another small adjustment. Put the foot on the floor. Adjust, look down his ear, make sure the knee's above, it's not, squeeze, go there, okay? You can hold the head while you do this, you feel more comfortable, but you should, should be able to do it without holding the head, okay? But very key, every time I adjust, don't let this go slack and the space arrive. Okay, so I'm going to re-kick through, claw down, move, and get myself into a position where I'm looking directly down his ear now. So, he's got a good beauty regime here. No hairs in there, there's no wax, but I should be able to see that. Okay? And now that should have gone across the ship. Obviously, there is uh, some kind of, if he's like, you know, he's, if he's like this with shoulders, you know, they've been doing a lot of lifting. Obviously, some points you might have to go here, but really, see, Gus is bigger than me, and I can still get over the shin really well here with no hands anywhere. So, this is what I'm going to aim to try and do. Okay? So, I want to just knock them off balance. Go here, and I want you to think about these pressures with the knees. Move yourself around. Get used to not doing things in one big movement if you have to. Put this down. Get used to <coughs> wiggling, moving your hips around. I want to be flat, looking down his ear, knee above his head. That's the position I want to be in before I start to squeeze. Does that make sense for everyone? Okay. Uh, I usually say that like, Jiu Jitsu is the art of advanced wriggling. Okay. <laughs> so get used to making like a lot of small movements to get to somewhere. Have like that position where you want to be in your mind, like I want to get to here. I do my movement, I'm not there, that's okay. Adjust, small wriggles, get yourself into a good posture. This should go over just fine. Okay. The theme of this year's camp is gratitude. And uh, I, I wanted to express some gratitude uh, to this organization. I've been with SBG uh, 20 years now, uh, which is really cool. And uh, one of the things I'm grateful for is I, I think it may be true that I'm the only coach on the schedule who's, uh, you know, a true hobbyist. So I've never been a full-time coach. I've never owned or run a gym. Um, and I've never coached more than twice a week uh, as long as I've been at the gym. And so um, it gives me maybe a different kind of a unique perspective on jiu-jitsu. And um, I'm appreciative that this organization um, allows me to flourish in that role. And it's one of the things that I love about SPG is that you can come in and carve your own path uh, that works for you. And, um, you know, coming up in SPG, Coach Matt never pulled me aside and said, Kane, you know, you're training like once or twice a week. I don't think that's going to be enough for you to get good. Or I need my black belts to train eight times a week or anything like that. Um, 
And so I've always appreciated that Coach Matt allowed me to carve my own path that way. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's one of the things that makes this gym special. There's no difference in the mat, or on the mat and in the gym between me and the professional fighters and anybody else. We don't carve out those hierarchies at the gym. Uh, and we're all equal. And so I appreciate that. And so I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I'll tell you a story about Hicks and Gracie that, that kind of got me to this curriculum today. Uh, we brought uh, Hickson in um, a few years back into Portland and we had this big gym we rented and he came in to teach and uh, I was super excited. I'm going to learn from the, the best that there is. And uh, we're going through the seminar and he gets to the point where he's teaching the UPA escape from Mount. And I'm like, here it is. I'm going to see it. And, um, you know, in my mind, I'm imagining, you know, here's somebody gets on top of Hickson and he grabs the arm and I'm certain the arm is like being crushed and he's going to hit this UPA and the guy's going to be like flying through the ceiling because it's Hickson Gracie. And then uh, the guy gets on top of him and then he does the UPA and he hardly brought his feet in. And his hips hardly left the mat, and it turned over, and I was so disappointed. <laughs> is that it? Is that? And I'm wondering, is, is Hickson just phoning it in? I mean, that was the, the worst-looking uh, UPA escape I've ever seen. And so uh, that sat with me. I'm like, I don't, I don't understand what's going on. And so uh, that was kind of my initial exposure to the material. And then uh, Coach Henry came in and taught it and gave some more details. Coach Matt taught it quite a bit and gave some more details. And so uh, I set myself on a journey uh, to stop using my elbow knee escape from Mount Bottom for about a year, because up to that point, that's all I did. That's all I had, it worked, it worked really good. And I'm like, I, I gotta figure out this UPA business. And so uh, I worked my game where I found myself in Mount Bottom. And then I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna use my elbow escape, I'm gonna use my UPA. And so uh, the material I'm going to show you today kind of came from that exploration. And so it's, it's one of the things that's a, a unique issue problem for the hobbyist, uh, which I am, is that um, I don't train enough to have a big jiu-jitsu game. Um, I have to have a smaller game that I can maintain. And so I need the stuff that I do to work over multiple scenarios. So I'm not a technique collector. And so... Um, and you have to think about that in your game. How much time do you have in your game? Um, capacity is important. <clears throat> but um, if you're not working towards efficiency, you're never going to get good just working capacity. The material I'm going to work tonight, so I didn't see it happening anywhere. Uh, so it means everybody gets to learn something new. Uh, when, when I'm looking at your Mount Bottom, I'm looking at people's feet, because that's going to be my... Uh, session tonight, what you do with your feet and um, how you use your feet effectively in Mount Bottom. Uh, there's two main positions for your, your uh, legs in Mount Bottom. There's an uh, inside position and outside position. And when I'm looking at people roll, everybody's good in uh, Mount Bottom when you get the inside position. So I'm just going to send you out just to do inside out position, uh, not, not for you to learn anything, but just so you know the difference between the two. I'm in inside position. Now I'm in outside position. Now I'm in inside position. And so it'll look like this in the Brian is in mount and his toes are touching. He has inside position. I have outside position. Brian's feet open up. He can't touch his toes anymore. Now I'm only in the inside position. His toes touch. I'm in outside position, his toes spread, he can't touch his toes, I'm in inside position. I'm in outside position, I'm in inside position. Do that with the partner real quick and then we'll move on. Uh, today, it's the one that I didn't see anybody using. So everybody looked really good when you got your feet inside and the top person could not touch their toes. So I want to work the other thing. And so we're going to start working a position here. I'll show you a couple of ways to do it. So I'm going to start with uh, my elbows inside of the knees and my palms cupping his uh, thighs like that. That's going to be important because that's going to put his feet in the spot where I need 
So my elbows inside the knees and then just palm here. Uh, I'm going to bring a foot up as high as I can. And if I have the knee flexibility, I can bring it up far enough that I make a, a sandwich, ankle, ankle, ass, with no space, ankle, ankle, ass. Uh, if I don't have the flexibility, I bring it up as much as I can, and then I shift my ass over towards it like that. So I make the sandwich. That's it. And then I'm going to take my other foot, and I'm going to bring it outside my silhouette like that. Bring my foot up. If I have to, I'm going to scoot towards it like that. My other foot outside the silhouette, elbows inside knees, palms will rest on the thighs. I just want you to do that. Do that back and forth. Wait, wait, one more time, man. Let's switch on this side. Sorry, it's it up, it's it up. I'll do it at an angle here. So, uh, elbows inside knees, palms, wrapping thighs. Bring your foot up and then make a sandwich. If you have to scoot over to do that and then look at how this is attached. And then bring this foot up and it's outside a little bit. So take a look at how that looks. I want to try as, as much as my flexibility will allow to have no space here. It's not the iron lock of death, but it captures that ankle a little bit between my ankle and my ass. Was everybody able to build at least pretty close to that reasonably? That's going to be the, the, the key ingredient to everything we do. So. Uh, before I get too far along, um, I, I always, when I coach, I coach from most to least important. <clears throat> and so that's important to know. So if you can imagine, uh, I got a pitcher, a beer, and a glass, and I'm filling the glass of beer. When do I stop? Before it's hot. When it's full, right? <laughs> and then I don't keep going. And so I want you to think of the same thing in, your, uh, in, in, in my class especially. Uh, when your brain gets full and you're like, that's cool, Kane, but I can't, there's no more I can put in, then, then you don't have to learn anymore. Uh, just stop and be like, I'm just going to do it, but I'm not going to try to remember it. And so just remember, the, if you remember the early parts, you got the good stuff, and it gets less and less important as you go. And uh, just like with that picture of beer, if you keep pouring, you're going to make a mess. And so I just want you to think about that as we go. All right, our next step. <coughs> So uh, there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set the top guy up with a certain mount just because it's going to make it easier to go. And so I'm going to have uh, Brian in a mount where his knees are in front of his hips. His hands are on the mat like that. And we got a little bit of space here. And this will just help us for learning. Uh, the mount I'm not going to have him do, go ahead and scroll, is that one like that. We're going to deal with that one later, but I don't want to start with that one. So everybody, can you see? How his knees are in front of his hips and his hands are on the mat. If you could do that as the top person, that'll help us for this part. So elbows inside, my hands are going to wrap. I'm going to bring this up and catch. And this goes outside of my silhouette. And now I'm going to start to apply pressure. And uh, one of the tricks, ideas to, to get the right pressure is the knee on the leg trap side drives towards the mat. And then I make an arch like that. And this is what I want you to get to, is just that. And then try it on the other side. I'm going to trap that one, build my base here, and I'm going to drive this knee down towards the mat, and then make an arch like that. Drop that up. Find silhouette, elbows inside the knees here. Drive this knee to the mat. And do that back and forth, and then we'll add a couple of details on. But I want everybody just to get to that point. All right, let's try. We haven't covered so much attacks this weekend, um, so I thought maybe maybe we'll cover some attacking, some how how to finish. Uh, my session will be a lot based on philosophy of jujitsu um, and really how to layer attacks together. So. One of the things about jujitsu is when we first start learning, we start learning different moves, different techniques, right? Here's a, an opa. Here's a, a way to escape the back. 
The beauty in jiu-jitsu though, and the effectiveness in jiu-jitsu, is not the single movements, but it's how things work in combination with each other. It's how you combine the movements. And so I sometimes kind of make the description, it's kind of like chess. When you first start learning chess, you learn how all the pieces move. But when you master chess, you understand how all the pieces move in combination with each other, right? Um, and so we're gonna talk about attacking from the cross side position. Uh, one of the main things, one of the major things about understanding how to attack, because while we're attacking, a lot of times what happens is we, we start to use our arms to attack. And a lot of times in doing that, we feel we lose control. A lot of us are very focused on using our arms to control. And so then when you start to let go, to grab an arm, to go for the neck, we feel like we start to lose control and that gives people the opportunity to escape. So the key in attacking is twofold. It's A, your ability to maintain position while you're attacking and deal with whatever they might throw at you to try to get out. And B, how you can combine attacks together so that everything your opponent does, it starts to get worse for them. So that was kind of always my experience uh, training with Hickson was um, even though I know I'm doing the right thing, he always made it the wrong thing. So when I was training with him, it was, it's kind of like being stuck in a spider web. The more you move, the worse it gets, right? So I want more weight on them. So very rarely am I on my knees. I'm mostly, and the other thing that being off my knees and off my hips does is it helps me to stay connected to my opponent. So that's, that's really one of the biggest things is it creates connection. So Anytime I'm on my knees, what happens is I'm connected to the ground. And if my opponent moves, if he creates a scramble, I will end up losing him, which happens many times. So a lot of times in jiu-jitsu, you'll see scrambles happen where there's a flurry of movement. And for the most part, that happens because we lose connection to our opponent. Okay? So I'll just give you an example. If I'm here and you just start to, um, just start to shrimp away from me, stretch away from me, yeah. see how you... Right, so I'm here, I'm on my knees, you start to move away from me. Yeah, see how I start, I'm stuck on the ground. But if I'm here, and you start to move away from me. No. So, the, the issue um, that we mentioned before, and I saw a couple people shake their heads when I said, hey, when we start to attack, a lot of times what happens is we have to let go, right? One of the main things that helps me to basically stay in control of my opponent is my connection to them through weight distribution, right? By having my weight on my opponent, what you see is as he moves, because my weight is on him, he carries me. Does that make sense? If I'm on my knees when he moves, he creates distance and I'm still stuck on the ground. Does that make sense? So when I switch, my arm comes here just above his elbow and I'm just clamping down on his arm. So try to pull this arm out. When my hip switches, my knee goes right next to his hip. The reason I have my knee next to his hip is because, again, one of the things he can do is he can try to put me in the guard, right? Try to put me in the guard here. It's hard because my knee's blocked. The other reason I need my knee next to his hip is because right now I'm also prepared to mount. Does that make sense? The closer my knee is to his body, the more distance I can clear with my leg. So what I mean by that is, if I have my leg here and I try to kick, and without even lifting your leg, I can't kick that far. If my knee is here when I kick, I can clear far more distance. So the amount of distance that I can cover with this leg is very much dependent on where the position of this leg is, right? Being here by his elbow, <clears throat> what it does is it neutralizes his underhook, and it also makes give me easy access to the wrist. Okay. So if I'm up here, guys that are smart will keep this underhook very active. So what happens now is he's got this active underhook. If I want to attack his arm, I have to do this. Does it look like I'm falling off balance? Mm -hmm. Right. 
it means I have to lean so far back to be able to grab the wrist that I'm actually off balance. This is a perfect time for him to bridge, right? So when I'm down here, see if you can reach that arm underneath my ribs. I can have access to the wrist, right? Knee here, hard for him to put me in the guard, right? So even though my leg is here, I'm not sitting. My weight is on him. And slight push, right? I can always drive. So this leg, this support leg, is always, anytime I feel like, oh shoot, he's doing the big bridge and I might fall, I can drive, I can push off this leg, right? To kind of help me keep my balance. So let's start talking about how I start to create pressure with my attack. Because at the lower level, when we start doing jujitsu, and many of you guys are at this place, so it'll be very familiar to you. When you're training, you kind of go through a Rolodex of moves, right? And you're like, oh shoot, let me try for this. And then he defends, and that doesn't work. And then, huh, let me think, what else, what else do I know from here? What else can I go for, right? So when you're doing techniques, you're throwing out techniques we try this, it doesn't work, we stop. Let me try this. Oh, he countered that, that doesn't work. At the higher levels, what happens is, for the most part, people will always stop the first attempt. They always counter. People are always ready to counter your first attack. It's the second and the third that will normally get them, okay? So that's what we wanna be able to do. We wanna be able to have, make sure that even when I go for the first one, right? If it doesn't, if it fails me, if he counters or defends for some reason, that I have another option immediately available that is open. Yeah? Does that make sense? So, I'm here. Let's just play with this attack real quick. I'm going to go over this arm lock. It's a very fast and simple arm lock. Okay? When I grab the wrist, let's turn this way a little bit. <clears throat> when I grab the wrist, I'm just going to push it to the outside. Push it to the outside. So do you guys see how I'm on the tricep side of the elbow? Okay. I just push it to the outside. My thumb switches to the same side as my fingers. So once I push it to the outside, thumb switches to the same side of my fingers. And what I do to control the wrist is, you guys see his wrist? It's very narrow here and wide here, right? So it's not exactly a circle, right? And so when I grab it, what I do is I cut my hand, I basically clamp it so that he can't turn his wrist. Turn your wrist the other way, good. Okay. Because a lot of times if I just push, turn your thumb towards your head. Yeah, do you feel, you can, so if I go here and you turn your thumb, turn your thumb. Yeah, so if I grab it with my thumb, I kind of make a circle and it gives his wrist the ability to rotate. When I do this, turn your thumb, Now look, grab my own wrist. Are you, are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. I don't want to turn my thumb. <laughs> Pinch my elbows together, okay? So my elbows come to my body. And all I'm gonna do is, yeah, see, it's, I don't know if you guys saw he just tapped. But this makes everything tight. Here he tapped. And if I need more power to finish, I would just start to curl my wrists. When I talk about pressure, there's kind of two types of pressure. There's pressure from me physically applying pressure, and then there's psychological pressure. When we attack, we want to create both physical pressure, but more important, psychological pressure. The psychological pressure, what it does is it creates panic, and it starts to force him to start making mistakes. All right, so with our drill construction, we want to start simple, start adding layers. Right, so we want to make it as simple as possible in the beginning, and then we add layers of complexity. Right, so we don't want to make it crazy because there are there are, there are limitations of what you can do without your hands involved. But remember, what what am I trying to do first and foremost? No matter what it is that I'm doing, what am I attacking? What am I defending? What am I attacking? What am I defending? Base posture. Base posture. I'm trying to control the connection, right? So even though my hands are here, can I still have some vote in how the connection goes? 
Like the other guy gets a vote, man. That's how violence works, right? Like, yeah. I'm not gonna go too far into that. But, um, so, you guys are like, I don't want to hear about that. We want to remember the good nice. All right, so let's do this. Let's add one more step. All right. So where's another place you can go? So if Coach Jesse and Coach Stephanie are down, and Coach Jesse's down, he's got bottom position. <coughs> She's got enough on her plate right now with the cool playlist. She just bring on all you guys. All right, so, so Jesse with his hands not in play. Don't cheat either, Jesse. You know who you are. So uh, he's going to try to get on his side, right? That's the first step. So he goes to get on his side. That's step one. All right, so that was the first form of this drill. Second form, stop. Second form was he brings his knee in, right? Third form is he's going to go all the way to his knees, so he can go to turtle, right? So turtle's a viable place from here, right? Now we all understand again, right? Turtle's not a great place to be in a fight, right? Which is why in the beginning I told you guys, like, yes, I understand violence. I've been violent. I've had violence done to me, right? So I get it. I understand that. Fighting is, is the main thing, right? However, for jiu-jitsu versus jiu-jitsu, which is where most of us are living nowadays, right? Going to turtle is a viable option. It's a, it's a, it could be a viable option in a fight, especially if you're Jesse. If Jesse goes to turtle against me, my life just changed dramatically if we're in a street fight. Because where's that turtle going to lead to? I'm going to get dumped on my bean and then drown the pound in the bush. Right? And I'm going to be like, it's a little bit of a problem. I was just trying to be funny. He got pissed. All right, so, make sense? So now, what's the third option? Turtle. Turtle. You guys are moving slow. We have to do that rope thing again. All right, so turtle, right? So we had up, up on the side, knee in, turtle. So you have three things you can do now. All right, so the drill's got one more layer of complexity. Person on top, same. Give them the same. Person on bottom, no arms. All right. All right, it's a skill, right? It's a skill. So now, let's see. So we have. Turning on our side, which is the most important, right? Because turning on my side does what to their base and posture? Disrupts it, right? It doesn't, it doesn't turn them over, but it definitely makes them have to adjust, which gives me opportunities, right? Hope oh, starts opening doors for me, all right? And then I start being able to control the connection and all that good stuff, right? So, turn on the side, get the knee in, go to turtle. What else can we do from there? What else is a possibility from there? Out the back. Sweet. We can go out the back, right? Yeah. So we can go out the back. So we can just go underneath. You can go north south and go underneath and come up, right? There's all kinds of things you can do, but the problem is doing it without your hands, right? When we plug the hands back in later, then it's going to be easy, right? And sense? Does anybody have anything they like to do from side control bottom, not yeah. buggy choke, because you're not using your hands? No, I'm inverted triangle. Inverted triangle. <laughs> inverted triangle is legit. You can do that. All right, so there's a tax from here. All right, so let's do one more round. The other person has to go. What's that? The other person has to go. Did I forget that? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Really? yeah. I knew that. It was a test. To make sure that you guys are staying with me. You're staying on track. I, you passed. You passed. <laughs> Leah, you came in second. All right, so let's go one more time. All right, and then think about, like, for our last round of this, what we can add. All right. All right. So we're going through, getting to our side, creating some sort of frame with our body, right? Um, getting a knee in, going to turtle. What else can we do from there? Stand up. Stand up. Yeah. You can stand up. We can. We can. We can kind of Gramby into guard, right? So you can kind of Gramby out, land in guard. You guys know how to do that. Right. So he's underneath. Go over your shoulders. There it is. And into guard. That's crazy. That's some crazy shit. That's crazy talk. Alright. If you're not comfortable doing that because you haven't done it before or because it's just not something you would do or you value your neck, I totally understand. Right? But if it's something that you do that's a legit part of your game, if you have a Granby game and you bring me into guard, is that an option? Is that something you could plug in if this was your drill 
to develop your game? Is that something you could plug in now? Right? Okay. So let's do this. People that can do that, go ahead and add that in. So now you have on your side, knee, turtle, Grammy. To full guard. Alright, once you get there, reset. Alright? Make sense? Everybody good. Any questions? We ready to go? Can you show us how to do it? Yeah, let's have John do it. I can't do it though. One more time. All right, one more time. He's on his side. He's going to bridge in, and he's going to get his hips free. So he gets his, and he's going to get up on his opposite shoulder, right? So he's got this shoulder. This shoulder comes down, and he's going to turn around, spin in, keep turning, keep turning, and there it is. Right. So basically, you're just going to Gramby into a guard pull. All right. Could you also just do it to a regular full guard pull? Yep. From there. Absolutely. All right. So, whatever way you get to guard, I want you to get to guard as an option. All right, so I want you to go to a full guard as an option. All right, make sense? Yes, sir. We're not gonna show you how to do it. I want you to figure out how to do it because that's the purpose of the drill. Make sense? Do sure. this a little bit more and then we're gonna switch some things out, right? So right now, what are we manipulating in the aliveness triangle? So what's being manipulated right now? So we got timing and motion, it's pretty close to like spot on. Like you're not going 100%, but your timing and your motion and your movement is pretty much legitimately what you would do if you were on top. So what are we manipulating? Resistance, right? So the person on the bottom, their resistance level is where? They're not allowed to use 50% of their body or their limbs. So the resistance is pretty low to whatever you're trying to do on top. Right? And yeah, your options are limited because their arms are just like this. It's hard to submit somebody who won't bring their arms up. So, how do we make it so the person on bottom can add a little resistance to the person on top and give themselves an assist? Because they've done the hard work, right? You've been doing this without an arm. So here's what I'm going to do. How many are right-handed in this class? Most of you? All right. So let's do this then. You have the use of your left hand. You can't use your right hand. You have the use of your left hand. The person on top has everything still, right? The person on top has all submissions available to them, right? Plus positional dominance to start. Person on bottom. Person on bottom, you have the left hand. You can get your knee in. You can get on your side and just stay there if you want. You can get your knee in. You can get to guard or you can get to turtle and then reset. If you get submitted, reset. Got it? Question. Yes, sir. If they start from using my left, but they underhook my right, can I engage with my right? All right, let me tell you something about Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> so one time I'm like, hey, let's play jujitsu chess as a cool down. So jujitsu chess is this, right? I'm not going to do it with Jesse. I'll do it with Cole. So jujitsu chess is this. So if I'm standing, Cole's an upright guard. So my first move is I step inside. Now Colton gets a move. So Colton goes, and he's like, no, I don't like it. So, right, here's Jesse's version of jujitsu chess. Hold on to this. Ready? Here's my first move. Okay. It's technically one thing because I never stop moving. So just know what you're dealing with. No, you can't use your right arm. If they, even if they dig it out, you're not going to use it. I'm telling you, always... I love guys that game it. It makes it more fun. All right, so left hand only on bottom. Everything else the same. Thanks for watching. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Hit the bell for frequent updates because we're updating this every week. And make sure you comment and like and share our videos. We appreciate it, and we definitely try and respond to all the comments. And if you like what we're doing and you like the material, check out SPG University, SPGU, uh, and you're going to see a ton more uh, in in much greater depth than what you see here on YouTube. Thank you very much.